Uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, again, for everyone that's joining, uh, we wanna welcome you all uh, to our panel number eight in our leadership and service series here at Peak. Uh, my name is Vishal Karavanka. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder for Peak. And today we have a very special guest and honored to have Dr. Mark Albion with us here today. Um, so I'm just gonna start off here, um, or the way the panel is gonna work is, uh, I think we have five or six uh, predisposed questions uh, that we'll go through asking Dr. Albion. And then in the last, I think 15 minutes is open to audience to ask uh, questions that they may have. Um, so I'm gonna start out here with an introduction about Dr. Albion and then we're gonna go straight into the questions. Um, so Dr. Albion is a social entrepreneur and author. He spent 18 years as a student and professor at Harvard University and Harvard Business School and was profiled on 60 Minutes as one of the top young business professors in the United States. He has served as a board member and consultant to major retailers and consumer product giants such as Coca-Cola and Procter and & Gamble and has written three award-winning marketing books. He left Harvard to develop a community of service-minded MBAs and co-founded Net Impact in 1993. He has since spoken at more than 125 business schools on five continents for which Business Week called him the savior of business school souls. Thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Albion. Thank you. It's, it's a bit of an old resume, but it still works. <laughs> yeah, I just, I pulled up the, Sorry, I pulled out about the author in one of your books that I... Okay, I, no, no problem. No problem. It doesn't matter. At, at my age, when you turn 70, it really is... It's just nice to still be here. <laughs> and it's really great that um, you all could join us. Um, and, and can you guys tell me approximately who's on? I mean, age group and all that, I really don't know. I'm sorry. Um, just so I know... Um, yeah, so um, it's usually a mixed half high school, half college students. Um, so we got upperclassmen, high school students, um, and then some early, I think, sophomore juniors uh, from college as well, I think across the country. So uh, we have some high school students from Houston and then college students all across the country. So, so the age group is mainly in that age. So we can go ahead and jump into the first question here. Um, so, you know, given that you have led an extraordinary career, sir, um, we just wanted to know, you know, what are you still most passionate about uh, and what drives that passion? And I know this is a little heavy question to kind of jump into here, but I felt like um, I think this is something that a lot of people submitted as you know, something they wanted answered. So we figured we'd start here today. Right. Well, thank you very much. It's a great question. And for me, it hasn't been that challenging, but it's certainly the road was challenging. The shortest distance on most of our journeys is, sort of like this, it's always under construction, you know. Uh, the paths are never linear, that's for sure. Um, but from relatively early on, and certainly that's a very, actually an, um, an old resume, I've actually been at Harvard, because I went back after that <laughs> for about 25 years, and, and it really came out of my experiences at Harvard Business School. I had the typical sort of, you know, um, achievement-oriented path, and um, in any case, my frustration at Harvard Business School, most of us, our passions come out of deep inside us. You have to be in touch with yourself. There's nothing more important than taking care of yourself and being clear about who you are and finding your voice. Uh, on an offshoot, the first time I ever used my own voice doing a public speech was when I was 46. Mm -hmm. um, it took me to 45 or 46 years old before I actually, 45 give a speech with my own voice. So it takes time. And even then I've lost my voice along the way. But what I was all very much most passionate about is particularly for people as fortunate as most of us are and probably a lot of you on the call is that, you know, we're here to serve. It's not about power, it's about service. It's not about domination, it's about sharing. Uh, one, of my, my, one of my younger daughters, my 33 year old, complains all the time about white privilege. And I go, you know what you do with white privilege? You help people who don't have privilege. And so for me, being in a place like Harvard Business School for, well, eventually 25 years, but certainly at the time that I left, it was 18. That's exactly right. Um, I was very frustrated both with myself and my students. And I realized that one question I always ask is, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? 
I've always wanted to be part of the solution. A lot of times we fool ourselves by making excuses, and I could give very current ones having to do with the current political situation, but I won't go there um, uh, since I personally happen to know uh, the person in the, uh, the office. But anyway, um, I think that, you know, that, that I was very, very frustrated by the fact that I wasn't doing more and that I knew underneath it all my students wanted to do more too, but they weren't being given a space uh, and this is what net impact was about. They were giving a space, a sacred space, a safe space where they could explore and grow and try new things and maybe take a career that really wasn't as financially remunerative, mm -hmm. but eventually would be a life. And we only have one of those. That's the biggest risk is not living your own life. So for me, my passion was about doing this for the next generation. I've always been focused on people probably a little bit older than the group today, although I've spent a lot of time in colleges. I've actually been to now over 650 universities, so a few more than, than was on the resume, but a lot of those were colleges when we decided in an impact to go into colleges. A uh, big difference, by the way, for those of you who are freshmen and sophomore between the first couple of years and the last couple, there's a big shift there. So um, if you feel like you're not getting to where you wanna go, you'll get there, although understand that you're in a period of history we were moving sideways. And that's another discussion we can have if you like. So my passion was about helping people really go out and find their purpose and make a difference. people. And you look at your life, it's about relationships. The great uh, anthropologist Conrad Lorenz one, once said, one chimpanzee is not a chimpanzee. And what he meant by that was one of us is not even a human being. It takes two. Everything's done in groups. In fact, as you may or may not know, the study of atomic particles, we're now founding that the particles are not the unit of analysis anymore because they've actually been able to put the same particle in two spaces at the same time. It's about the relationships between particles. And that, of course, gets into neuroscience. So it's the same for us in developing a destiny plan. While it's about you, in a lot of ways, it's not about you, but it's listening to what it is and feeling what it is you gravitate to. Things you think are fun, but you go, I couldn't make money doing that. Who knows? Unless you try. Sometimes, of course, you can't try all the time. You have to try on your weekends. At night, you have to have your day job. So that's another part is, is sort of that trying and the making mistakes. And as I said, the third part is in your destiny plan, who are the people that are going to be around you? Uh, we find from, again, most of my research has been done on MBAs, some on college seniors, but not on uh, people uh, earlier on in college or high school. Um, and we found that the number one thing that really keeps them happy, and it's morphed over the last 20 years, has been things like who your colleagues are. Do you respect them or like them? Do you have a good boss? That's critically important. And in more and more geography. People are picking locations where they're nearer to family or whatever, and certainly with COVID-19, that becomes more important. But it's not your traditional types of, you know, salary, being challenged, learning. Those are all important. So the third part of putting together a study plan is the people part. Quick funny on that, not a funny, but, but I used to um, be one of the uh, judges and also one of the uh, final judges for the MIT business plan competition. They usually do a bunch of competitions a year. In one year, uh, they won their track. We have seven tracks, but they didn't win the overall prize. It was a company called Guitar Hero. You may or may not have heard the software. None of us believed in it. Nobody would buy it, et cetera. And of course, they did very well. They then eventually flamed out. But at, about three years after they uh, started, they came back and they were the key keynote speakers at the MIT finals. And he basically said it had nothing to do with the products that what really got them moving was they just got a great bunch of people and it just kept growing. So I can't, I can't tell you how important it is that, frankly, while products and services are critically important and they should add value to our society, what's really important in your plan that most people don't think of it is who are you going to be surrounding yourself with? If you're going to be a lawyer and you're going to be a law firm, are you going to like the senior partners? Or as one of my friends, well, I don't want to get into that. That would be trashing lawyers, not fair. And it happens in every profession. It's not about the profession. It's really about you and how you relate to your job and where you work. I've had a number of students go into finance, and I've had them at Goldman Sachs and Morgan, you know, all these companies. And some of them have had phenomenal careers, made a big difference, and also, frankly, made a bit of money. But, you know, it really comes down to you. It doesn't matter the profession or whatever. It's how you're attracted to it. You're excited about it. As the Buddhists, as actually the Zen Buddhists like to say, after ecstasy is the laundry. If it really is passion and ecstasy to you, 
you won't mind doing the laundry because every job has laundry. So those are different pieces that I'm trying to give you ones that you wouldn't expect in putting together a destiny plan. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Dr. Albion. And I think this kind of uh, nicely segues into the next question, which is about, you know, not letting other people define, you know, who you are, uh, not letting other people tell you what to do. For instance, I think, you know, we always try to do what our parents want us to do or something like that, right? Um, and so, you know, how do we, or this new generation that's coming up, um, how do you advise people on finding, you know, our own unique, I think you call it little voice. Um, and, and, and in today's world, it's really hard. We got all this social media, this online, you know, internet, uh, you're being bombasted with information. How do you figure out, or how do you advise us to find uh, our little voice? <laughs> it is called, you know, it's Dom, uh, in Hebrew, it's, uh, it's Dom Cole, yes. It is called, actually in the Bible, it's called the little, the small voice. Um, um, very true, very well said. Obviously, this is the million dollar question, isn't it? And, and trying to keep it in, just to give you an idea of how, you know, flawed I am. I took a job as a university president, having been pushed by my friends to do it, even though knowing that what I love to do is I love to teach, I love young people, um, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, I love to help them and I love to research and write. I'm not an administrator, but I, I did take that job. And I took that job when I was almost 60 years old and I lost my voice. So the first thing I wanna say is just cause you found it doesn't mean it's easy to keep it. <laughs> But finding it again is this sort of process. Uh, some of my friends, in fact, a book that was the, the prequel to the book that you read, um, More Than Money, was called Making a Life, Making a Living. That came out in 2000, um, and, and I was asked to do a sequel to it, um, and we also developed a company called More Than Money Careers, which we since sold, which had about eight or 9,000 different socially responsible tracks you could take. Uh, this is very well done by Mer Dr. Marim Butla. We really led that, a neuroscientist. And uh, we tried to make the more of the money and the finding your voice come to life and actually give you some tools for that. But finding your voice is extraordinarily tricky because of what you said. It, but what you said is, in, I think it's in the more of the money book. It's, they're called VOJs, Voices of Judgment. By the way, I didn't come up with that name. Um, as they say, if you steal from one person, you know, that's plagiarism. If you steal from many people, that's good research. That's research. So I'm a good researcher. I forget who came up with them, but I, I've used that repeatedly. And as you said, quite rightly, it's either what you think the people who are important to you think or what you, what you perceive they think, whether they think it or not. It starts with your parents, then obviously it becomes more of your peers. We want to be different exactly the same way your peers are different. And these are all very normal things that we go through. But when you get to middle lessons as opposed to adolescence, it's really time to begin to find what your voice is. And it is complicated because as I said, I did not speak with my own voice till June 6th, uh, 19, let's see, what would it be? Uh, oh no, 2006. I'm sorry, excuse me, 1996, I'm sorry. Tell my age, huh? Can't get the numbers right. I gotta get somebody from MIT to do the math. Okay. I used to be a math person, what happened? Okay, it took me to 45 to actually strip away everything everybody was telling me to do as I made an official speech to the United Nations. I was our representative that year for how to, how to, how to help build and educate socially responsible young leaders for for-profit businesses, NGOs, government, etc. And went to give this 19 minute speech and after the person, uh, the president from France who spoke before me after all the delegates were asleep, um, I threw out the speech and talked from my heart. I spoke from my heart and um, it was really very special. So what got me to that point? What helped me find my voice? Well, in the Making a Life book, we talked, we had a whole chapter on this and we talked a lot about, you find out where you fit in by not fitting in. A lot of finding your voice is finding what isn't your voice. A lot of times it's hard to know. It's sort of like with a, with a profession. Some people are born, they want to be doctors, lawyers, business people, accountants, uh, artists, whatever it may be. But for most of us, we're really not particularly sure. We're interested in lots of different things. The more specific you can get into it, the easier it is to find. But finding your voice is really, for me, 
I think by the time I was 50, I had developed a compass that I knew where I should be and where I shouldn't be. Like doing this, how many of these do I do? None, this is the only one. Some reason when I got this invitation, I said, I think this is what I'm supposed to be, this is my voice. So a lot of voice for me is connected to what you do and how you express it, as opposed to, I really caution against sitting around and thinking and trying to figure things out. I'm not saying we shouldn't be contemplative. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be content. What I am saying is that the only way most of us learn is through visceral experience. So it's the same with finding your voice. It's really, it's not that you, you both rebel and want to emulate your parents. How do you integrate those two things? Same with your friends. You know, I mean, I have, I have kids who are more into social responsibility. They're not moving as fast in their careers as many of their friends who went into finance or law or whatever. So what does that do to your voice? And I think your voice is very deeply, deeply connected to you having a strong sense of yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you know exactly who you are, but feeling good about yourself. In fact, particularly during this period, talking to a lot of young people, not through this means, but through others every day, I say the biggest thing, if I had one recommendation, it would also help you find your voice, is to be kinder to yourself. Stop beating yourself out much. Stop worrying about how you're going to change the entire world. Help one person read. And I'll give you a, an insight into college admissions that is not public, but I think I can talk about this. I've, I've had the privilege of working on um, college admissions a lot of my life and being an admissions officer um, at Harvard. And one of the things that is very seriously being looked at as well as, as along with no grades and no uh, test scores, which I know the test scores aren't happening now because of COVID-19, but this has been in the works for about five years, is also that extracurriculars will be looked at differently because we want to know if you found your voice. And the way we know you found your voice is that maybe you spent three years tutoring one child. We don't want the, I climbed Kilimanjaro, I did this, I did that, I did this. No, no, no. Finding your voice is about not being superficial, it's about going deep. We have a problem in society today, I believe, in that it's a problem of superficiality in everything we do. What happened to critical thinking? What happened to being data-driven? What happened to understanding how you go from data and then you go to information, how you go through that process? We seem to have forgotten that. And by the way, it isn't just in the last few years, it's been going on for decades. So I'm not pointing my finger at anyone or any particular country, but, and I point my finger at myself. I'm much more superficial than I used to be. I don't have the focus that I used to have to be able to go deep. But finding your voice is about this wide and that deep. It's about really going deep into who you are. Now, how, how do you do that? Let me give you some examples, some are in some of the books you may have read. Things like looking at what you really love to do before you were 12 years old. Quick funny on that. The first time I ever talked about that, um, the expression I used, which I stole from Ram Dass, who died uh, in the last year, a uh, spiritual leader, um, was that, you know, I basically used the expression, what did you want to do before the world should on you, should, the word should. <laughs> now you can imagine how that sounded. And the first time that I said it, I was doing, I was promoting one of my books in New York, in Westchester County, and I was doing one of the, I guess it was Good Morning New York, you know, one of those morning shows. I had my five minutes and 15 seconds to go. And I got to that point and I said, well, what did you want to do before the world should on you? They blanked the screen, cut me off, kick me out, and I had to walk out, and it's the only time I've ever walked by her and meet her. I had to walk by Hillary Clinton, who was coming on to announce her candidacy for the U.S. Senate. <laughs> One of my most embarrassing moments of my life. But it really is trying to go back to, and there's a lot of research on this. This is not, you know, just coming off the top of my head here. There's a lot of research on 11 and 12-year-old girls and boys that a lot of the things you're interested in then, go back to them. Like for me, when I was a little, when I was about eight, I used to write short stories and sell them door to door. I used to get a mimeograph. We didn't have copy machines at my grandfather's textile mill. And I, and I still, I actually have the stories. I found them years ago. The stories like I went mad. Uh, you know, I was the fiery demon, you know. I mean, I wasn't Hemingway, but what the heck. I sold them for three cents for one page and five cents for two. Right? Everybody bought them. 
What did the voices outside say to me? What do you want to do, Mark? Oh, I want to be a writer. You can't be a writer. Writers don't make any money. Now, the truth is they were right, but <laughs> that still didn't mean I couldn't try. Similarly, in finding my voice, another thing I tried is I used to have a little uh, stand, sort of like Peanuts, if you remember Peanuts, and Lucy had a stand where she'd give advice. Well, I used to do that, and I'd give advice to people on how to get along better with their brothers and their sisters. I charged five cents for that. So my parents said, by the way, I'm Jewish, and you know, if you're Jewish, you're not like, you know, you're not like a real person unless you're a lawyer or a doctor, right? You don't count. So my parents said to me, oh, this is really great. You want to become a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm sorry, psychiatrist. And I said, no, I want to be. Now, if you want to kill your parents, here are two words you should use or never use if you don't want to hurt them. I want to be a social worker. Oh, my God. They had me lined up as banker, and, you know, you can imagine. But these were all ways that I was trying to find my own voice because I was just doing things that I enjoyed doing. By the way, and giving me advice to uh, for people on getting along with their siblings, at the time, I didn't have any siblings. <laughs> I was an only child for two more years. So it shows you, you don't even have to have expertise, right? You just have to have some. So finding your voice is constantly testing these things out. And where the thinking comes in is start acknowledging things that other people have helped me with. What's your body language like? Gee, you're doing things you really like. You get animated. And then you're talking about your business and you're like, give me another scotch, right? Okay, so you have clues all around you. Ask your friends. Friends are really great. Parents are not good to ask. That's, that's a whole other dynamic for a lot of reasons. You may have a relationship that works, but it's really cool to have other people, and I've done that with myself because I've had such a crazy career. It's really interesting when I run into people, how they introduce me to somebody else, and that tells me a lot about who they see me as. For example, all the years I was doing business, People would always, even when I played, I was a pretty good baseball player, you know, division one, uh, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. They used to call me the little professor. I played center field. I never connected with that, that I always enjoyed that role, but it took me a while. So a lot of finding your voice too is just listening to people around you and see how they relate to you. But I just want to caution that it is not, again, it's not a linear process. It's a lifetime process. It means you do listen to people, but you don't listen to people. And that's the really hard part, particularly when you're someone like me who didn't do what my parents, and I'm, I was very close to my parents, but I didn't do what they wanted me to do. You know, um, I, I really went another direction. My dad called me predictably unpredictable. You know, predictably when I would get to something and make an important decision, I would make the wrong decision, according to him. So, you know, for me, it had to be my life. So I think those are just, you know, some random thoughts, I guess, on finding your voice. Yep. I mean, I think it was, in a sense, uh, it was very powerful. I think understanding to go deeper, and I think the superficial part was something that uh, I, I really connected with, because I think, um, especially with social media, I don't know, in our generation, everyone always posts pictures, and you know, you're looking, and you're like, oh my god, this person's doing this or doing that, and I don't know, I think it just opens up a different, whole different world, and you know, that's why we wanted to ask this question. Um, but thank you for your response, sir. And I think, uh, the next question here is about, um, you know, I, I think it was a question you yourself had submitted, sir, um, which was about COVID-19. Um, and, you know, everything has changed during this time, right? I mean, everything is remote from learning to work. Uh, and you have seen companies suffer major economic consequences. Um, what do you think are important questions to be asked regarding life and careers in a time like this? Find your own corner of the world. I think it's the most important thing. I think you need to find your own place in the world. I think one of the challenges, certainly with, uh, with our students, is that they're all, they're saying, you know, what can I do, those sort of things. And, and the two parts of COVID, the first part I already told you, it's very much about, it's really funny with the masks. And I'm going to credit uh, one of my rabbis, Rabbi Karen Citron, Westwood uh, Temple, Beth David, uh, uh, had this in her uh, Rosh Hashanah sermon. But the notion of a mask, um, for those of us, I don't think too many people on the call have um, children, but when you do, the first time you fly with them and, and they talk about the oxygen and, you know, coming down and, you know, if we're, if we're, you know, we're going to need oxygen, you know, it'll, it'll pop down from up above and make sure you put on your mask first. And that's really weird as a parent, I got to tell you, because you're looking at that little baby, whatever, and you'll do anything for that baby. And if something happens, you're going to, you're not even going to think about yourself. 
I think that's the first thing, and I've already mentioned it briefly. Um, the word in Hebrew, there's a really great word in Hebrew, uh, also in, in actually in Islam as well, very close, called chesed. And chesed is a combination of love and kindness. And I think that we think about that all the time in terms of other people. But as I mentioned earlier, I think number one in COVID-19, this is what I do with my, my all my children have moved back into our house with their partners, with their we got, a, we got a house full of a lot of people and a lot of animals at the moment, including chinchillas and other things. But anyway, um, I think the first thing is you really have to take care of yourself. And this is a great time that we're all in a timeout. And I don't want to get too deeply into it. This is not the audience for it. I'm involved in a project of what will the world look like in 50 years with some extremely good people. The world's changed now dramatically. It's not going to go back to the way it was. We have a new world now. Simply good things. Um, Apple, for example, most of the workers, they don't want to go back to the office. <laughs> Some of us are finding, you know, a lot of things are working pretty well on Zoom. You know, not that we're going to not get back together. We're all very social people, social animals, um, as Loren said. But so I think the first thing is really trying to take care of yourself. I like to say we're all doppelgangers right now. We think we're the same but we're not. And the expression I use, and I'm stealing this a little bit from some Japanese friends from 40, 50 years ago, is we're living in a world where we're moving sideways. What do you do when you're living in a world that's moving sideways for your career? We have historical examples. I'll take the Japanese example as being the most recent, even though it was about 50 years ago. The Japanese example was there was a period that the Japanese began to start coming over to the U.S. with mo small motorcycles. And, and it was, oh, they'll, they, they can make the small ones, but they can't make the big ones like we can in the United States. Well, of course, they got to the big ones, and they got to small cars, big cars, et cetera. Before you knew it, over the course of about a decade, the Japanese were selling extremely high-quality products at all price points and kicking our butts. So the response was simply, well, you know, they have the banks helping them. They have the government helping them. That's why. Well, Bill Abernathy and Sam Hayes did a little article at Harvard Business Review called Managing Our Way to an Economic Decline. And what it talked about is it didn't have to do with these things. It had to do with how the Japanese had learned to manage differently than we were managing at the time in the U.S. And the management was they managed sideways. What does that mean? It means they didn't continually promote people up, 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 up. They promoted them sideways. It wasn't about going higher. It was about learning more about the company. It was about taking your specialty, get deeper in your specialty, but understanding how it fit in better to the whole by learning different parts of the organization. I think this is a great time, if I were building my career, to do some sideways movement. Um, it's a really good time to begin filling out. I, I mean, for me, for example, I am doing a lot of classes out of, you know, Scandinavia, out of Israel, out of uh, South Africa, et cetera, things I couldn't normally do because I'm not going to travel to all those places. So there are opportunities here to start to really broaden yourself sideways. The reason I think it's important and without the details is again, I think we're entering a different world. Um, Mother nature said, I've sent you a million signals and you're not getting it. So guess what? You got to treat my planet better and you got to treat each other better. And if you don't, well, Mother Nature ain't going anywhere, but maybe you are. So whatever. So that means we have to be prepared in different ways. And while being a specialist is always critically important, being the best at one thing, being the unique one in that, I think that this is a great time moving forward, given the uncertainty of the future to really move more sideways in the way you look at your career right now. Looking at things that are great opportunities, great ways to learn, even if they're not promotions. Mm -hmm. I think the second part of COVID-19, I've actually, um, I'm very involved in startup socially responsible businesses, have been pretty much all my life. Um, I have seen a number of presentations lately which are done by cut people who have been at Yahoo and Microsoft, very talented people, um, have already built their own companies and are building companies now structured around a world with COVID-19. 
what does that mean? Well, it obviously means they're looking at running it more technologically, more in the world that you guys, more than I, are much more familiar with of social media. They're even they're structuring the business, assuming that even if it's not COVID-19, these masks aren't going away. They're going to become part of our lives. And if they aren't, well, better for us. But they're structuring what they do, assuming that this isn't going to change dramatically. For example, they're not going to go into the restaurant business. Or if they do, they're going to do it quite differently. Uh, actually, my nephew just went into it, but he does delivery, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's the third thing is that understand that while the conditions will change, things will get better. They always do. Again, if you read history, there was the 14th century, 12th. We could go through lots of periods where things like this happened. We do rebound, but when we do, it's another world. When you don't know what another world is, it's great to have a specialty and then broaden your base. Sorry, I think I'm muted. Um, <laughs> No, thank you for that story. So I think it's very interesting how you're talking about uh, moving vertically, because I think a lot of young people, especially like ourselves, are always thinking about, oh, how do we get higher and higher? So I really appreciate that um, that answer, sir. And I think what we're going to do here is uh, skip one of our questions here and move to the last question so we can uh, give some time to the audience. But, um, you know, our mission here at Peak, sir, is to build the next generation of social entrepreneurs, right? I mean, we have people in high school working on cool projects, including, you know, teaching financial literacy, things like that, to make sure the next generation is more able to solve these problems, right? Um, what do you think are important skills that young leaders such as our members should develop at this time? Um, I think one of the things that you said in your book while you were talking to nonprofit executives was this notion of multicultural sensitivity, right? Is there something else you know, along with that, or, or I mean, in aid, I mean, whatever you think, it does that still hold true today? Uh, uh, yes, actually, um, the president at the time, I, I, I gave a speech at 9-11. Th that all comes from a book of mine called True to Yourself. The, the, the three more recent books in this era I have is Making a Life, and that's about people going sort of their own way and making a difference and finding their passion. It's about finding your purpose and passion business. Then the next book would be the one you read, which came tenured over 10 years later, which is more than money, which is really more about how do I do that? And then at the next level is a, a book I wrote called True to Yourselves, which is a leadership, a values-based leadership book. And that's what directly addresses this is what are the skills we need to sort of move up? in our lives. This is more the vertical to like take the boss's job, to keep moving along. What are the skills I should develop? And this is actually the work that I did for the United Nations. That's where, and, and I shouldn't say I did for the United, that's the work that I was the mouthpiece for, for the United Nations. There were 30 odd other people from around the world that spent a year working on our report, which is actually online, uh, about 800 pages on exactly this question for, and we're like you, we're all focused on leaders. We're gonna make a difference in the world. Otherwise, we're not, you know, I'm not interested in many, many products and services, but ones that will make a difference. So what are the things we came up with? The multicultural is big. When I've visited colleges, I'll notice that a lot of the top students are learning Mandarin. Um, there's no question that when I've been asked, this is mostly, I, I had a role at Harvard Business School as an administrator and I've been a dean and all that. And so when I would talk to the incoming class of 800, I would talk about that, you know, in terms of you know, the, not the multicultural sensitivity, but what's the most important sort of set of skills they need? It's very simple. It's the people skills. It's communication. It's all about communication. I can tell you, uh, I hope there aren't any HBS people on here, or, and I'm only taking it at HBS because that's my experience, even though I've spent a lot of time at other schools, but most of my life has been at HBS. And I mention it because we have really bright students. Most of them can't write. And that's in their native language. We're not even talking about all our students who are writing in a second, third, or fourth language. Communication is critical. It's critical to be able to communicate in five words, in seven words. If I can be political on an opposite comment that you would think I would ever make, Donald Trump is really good at this. He is an excellent five word, seven word, short word brander. And there's a lot of neuroscience about that. Most of our young people, they can write a great 20 page paper. But I gave a course undergraduate at Harvard at one time. We, we had quite a few people sign up, which was on how to write a paragraph. 
about your business to a lead or whatever. So communication skills are by far, in my opinion, the most important. Um, many leaders I know, um, I don't know if you guys uh, have heard of some of like working assets, some of the earlier uh, companies in, in these fields or Calvert Fund, maybe you know Calvert Fund, that's a pretty big one. Well, Barbara Krumshek, who is running Calvert Fund, our largest socially responsible funds, once told me that she has 300 direct reports. Her number one job and skill is knowing how those 300 people like to be communicated with. And particularly in the world you're growing up in with social media and all this, some people like it public, some like it private, some like it in email, some like it personally. Some Learning how people want to be communicated with is critically important because, again, if you want to reach your dreams, you've got to help other people reach their dreams. That's the way it works. And each of us, you know, each of us has sort of, I believe, you know, some, some divinity, some spirit in it, in us. And if we can set off that spark in each other, that's really a really critical skill. So by far the most important skill to me is communication, whether it's written, whether it's oral. Um, a very quick thing, Mary Gentili has done a phenomenal program that's been around now for 20 years called Giving, Giving Voice to Values. It may have been at your school. And what it basically says, this is about how you express your values in business. And most of the teaching is done by you getting on your feet and actually doing it. That's another thing. There's a lot of cognitive research that as you're developing skills, for example, when I did my orals for my doctorate, I didn't practice by reading a lot of things. I stood in front of a board with 50 questions just like uh, that was going to be asked. So understanding all the different forms of communication and being effective at it is by far the most important skill. Underneath that too, everybody should have technological background. Everybody needs to have data, you know, a, a strong computer background. If you don't, you're going to be left behind. The gap's going to get wider, unfortunately, I believe, not any smaller. We have to work hard to try to narrow that gap between rich and poor, between technologically with and without. But the reality is the first thing that I would make sure all of my young people have is a technical background. Critical. Great. Well, um, I think uh, that was a great uh, segue to understanding, you know, way what we should be developing as a, as a young generation. I want to open up the floor now um, for members in the audience to ask any questions they may have. Um, you can, I think, directly send us a message in the chat and we can go ahead and uh, read that question uh, to Dr. Albion. So I think actually one of our members, Shashrik, had a question about AI. Um, you want to come up and mute and talk about it, Shashrik? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, my main question was regarding uh, like how AI is taking over the world. Um, you can see in social media every day that um, it's kind of oblivious to us in plain sight. So how do you think uh, you know, young people today, uh, such as high schoolers or just college students, how do they adapt to that type of environment? And I know you mentioned that techno uh, technological skills are really important in a day like this, but what other skills other than, you know, you mentioned communication, what other skills are really important to have in your uh, toolkit? Yeah, that, you know, f f first of all, two things. It's, of course, an extremely important question. Um, in my view, you know, the, the big, biggest thing coming, I think, you know, as a species, uh, innovation we're really good at. We, we, get, we get issues about empathy. We get issues about lots of things, but we don't, we're really, I think, very good at innovation. And um, what you don't know is I have a very strong technical background. Um, you know, sold one of my companies to Apple, um, you know, knew some names that you would know all these people. I, I knew most of the founders because I was an early guy. I used to build computers and used to have build my, my Altair 8800A pre-Apple uh, and all those guys. I was a little hobbyist and, and that's why I made my money was writing programs for, um, for uh, uh, people to run their businesses, mostly accounting programs. Um, but anyways, and develop more. And then the other guy that I wrote with, the, he actually started a company called Adobe. So he did, he did a lot better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, but he was he was a brilliant brilliant guy at that. So I've been involved in the computer world my whole life um, in technology, and I remember 1987. I have a video of what would become an iPhone, iPad, whatever. Except it's a little more advanced than we still had, and we believed we'd have it in 2000. The difference was it was actually a, an artificial agent 
running things, sort of like Siri, but as a person that would really run things. But it was pretty much what we saw. And we talked a lot about AI back then, particularly Alan Kay. To, if you don't know who Alan Kay is, Alan Kay developed the uh, GUI, the GUI. The graphical user interface that was first on Mac, now on PCs everywhere, that was Alan. He was the first ever um, Apple genius. I mean, he was reading Charles Dickens at three and, and, and doing calculus at five. So, Alan, and so we talked a lot about AI. And he looked at it because he's a lot smarter than me. And I'm an economist, remember, so I'm good at predicting the past with increasing precision. That's my what I'm very good at. Don't ask me about the future, but I'm good at the past. So Alan used to say that, you know, I don't really know the numbers you all or somebody out there might know them better than I, but like every 40 years, like asking somebody, what do you want to do when you grow up when they're 10 is like ridiculous because 30, 40% or 50% of those jobs are going to be gone anyway. Well, AI is going to destroy even more of them. I had a very close friend commit suicide last year. Um, it's well known. It's a publicly well known thing. Um, he was called by Steve Jobs to uh, develop something called iTunes. Um, Gary was the most knowledgeable person in the world. He ran all that stuff for Rhino Records before that for Richard Foos at a wonderful, wonderful independent label. And Gary knew, he knew more about music than anybody you've ever met. And I used to see him five, six times a year, many years. He was freaking unbelievable. His anthology of music was second to none. And that's why not only did Steve hire Gary, but allowed him to stay in LA and just visit Cupertino once a week. And Gary did that, as you know, iTunes did pretty well, et cetera, et cetera. And Gary lost his job a couple of years ago. Why? AI. We can do this now with AI, Gary. We don't need you. So my first piece of advice is understand what you're doing, how AI may or may not either compromise it or make it obsolete or maybe enhance it. So what would be the kind of things that you could get into that AI, rather than replacing you, would enhance you. And I, I just think on time, I should probably stop there. But, but it's absolutely real. It's, it's not unique in history. We've had many innovations that have really been game changers, as you know. Most innovations take about 50 years before they really, that's historically accurate. That may not be accurate in the future. Um, and I think that, that while this is an enormous shift, you need to be able to look at how you can dovetail off of that because I think AI is going to be it. It's going to be, you know, obviously change our world dramatically. That is unless we, that's assuming that we take care of our planet first. <laughs> and that all of you vote if you're over 18. I asked a whole bunch of young people, what should I say today? Every one of them said, make sure everybody votes. <laughs> so vote for your world. So anyway, assuming we have a world that's, that's running on all cylinders, AI is going to be a, uh, obviously a large part. Thank you for answering that question, Dr. Alvin. I think our next question comes from uh, Vaishnav. I'll ask him to unmute real quick and ask it. Sure. So <clears throat> I'm actually going to be reading a question from Prasant, who is currently in the audience. His question is, what advice would you give to folks that are in careers or are on track to be in careers where they're not really 100% sure if that's a career track that they're truly passionate about? And maybe it's something they're pursuing to achieve a sense of financial and economic security. How would you motivate and inspire people in that situation to not pigeonhole themselves in that career and continue to keep searching for that passion rather than just settle and maybe take the easier, sometimes more comfortable route instead? Right, right. Well, that's, you know, that's one of the seven central questions. Um, I, I get about, I used to get about, I get about 400 emails, questions a day, and they all fit, they all fit in seven questions. And that's usually question one or two. That's right at the top. I mean, it's the one we all think about. And, and first of all, the reality, again, I'm not asking you to read any of my books and all the money's donated to different groups and books anyway. So it's not a financial thing, but I'm not, there's lots of great books out there. Um, but one of my, I call them lifelines in the book, um, you know, in the more than money book, one of them is money doesn't talk, it swears. There's two things everybody has to come to terms with in their career and their life. One is how much money do they need? What's enough? And understanding that you're trading your life energy for money. Don't make it a cheap trade. Understand, I had period, look at, I'll be honest with you guys, I, even though it's been recorded, this I don't mind saying. I, I, took, I took the job uh, when I was 60 because I really needed the money. My last company had gone down the tubes. Net impact, of course, which I've you know, been very heavily involved with day to day. I don't make money from that cost me money. It's a 
you know, it's a pro bono thing for me. It's a thing of just helping out. So my money had dried up and I had really not, not done very well for the last few years because I hadn't sold any of my companies yet. So I took the job for money. I lasted one year. I said it last year. I lasted a year and then ran, ran for the hills. That's not a commentary on the job. It's me. I don't like to have a boss. I hate having a boss. I hate having a job. Always did as a kid, my whole family, my father, my mother, my grand, everybody's an entrepreneur in our family. So I think that, you know, the, in, in terms of the career advice, it's, it's really at the heart of more than money is to think about what's risky. Is it riskier for you to have a career where, you know, I grew up at a time where almost all my friends became lawyers. The ones who enjoyed it, they morphed in their 30s into other things, started doing journalism with that. They went to smaller towns. Some became judges, et cetera, et cetera. So even if a, if a profession seems to be just a money profession, it's up to you to make it into something that's fun for you. And if you can't, again, this is all throughout the books. We say keep your walking costs low. Then you walk. I've walked a number of times. cost me a lot of money, but it kept my integrity intact. I actually didn't walk once. I wrote about that one. That's when I lost my integrity. So I made a mistake in all of these. So I think the first thing, you know, that you have to think about is that what's more important to you? And at certain times in your life, the most important thing is making money. I had a student. Uh, she's Asian, very strong uh, Asian family, um, had a brother die. They wanted to do this memorial. They needed money. She wasn't going to be leaving Goldman Sachs for the next couple of years. Not that Goldman Sachs is a bad employer, but she wanted to move on, but she needed the money. So don't, I'm not trying to diss money. However, what's more important over the course of your life? Leading a life where you basically become a wallet, where you help the economy keep going, or leading a life where you feel like you're a child of God, that, you, that you're, in my religion, it's B'Tselem Elohim, that we're all in the image of God, that we're all here to try to help each one of us, you know, help whoever we touch, make it through um, to the next day and the next week and the next month and maybe even thrive. So I have just seen so many, uh, again, I've been around for a long time. I've had so many students break down crying in class at Stanford and many schools. I've written about some of them because their voice and who they are is being masked by a culture of power and greed and money. And greed, the thing about greed is greed eats everything. When you get into that mode, and I've, again, I've asked a number of my friends, because your question is the heart of all my work, really, because I come from a background which is certainly about going to the best schools and making a lot of money. I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole ethic in my family. And uh, although my mother, who, who's, I'm still running her business, she passed away a few years ago, still doing well, she was always very much into, hugely into making, uh, she's, uh, she's won a lot of awards, she's quite a role model. And I've written about her extensively as well. So I think that back to your, you know, the initial question, think about what's riskier. And the riskiest thing is not living your life. COVID-19, if it's taught us nothing, it's taught us how fragile life is, how fragile life is on the planet and how fragile our own lives. And, and life can change in a dime. So what the heck are you waiting for? Uh, Warren Buffett was at our school one day uh, speaking in the auditorium and a student asked him, said, Mr. Buffett, what I want to do is first go out and make a lot of money for about 10, 15 years and then go and do what I really, really want to do. What do you think about that? And Mr. Buffett said, well, Sonny, sounds to me like you're saving up sex for old age. What are you waiting for? Now, again, sometimes you do have to wait. Sometimes you have a, you know, sometimes there's things in your life. But you know what the people I know have done? I don't, you probably don't know Seth Goldman, but you might know his companies. He uh, started Honest Tea, uh, which is now mostly owned by Coca-Cola. And now he's uh, executive chairman running Beyond Meat, um, which is the only public one of those companies. Seth is just an incredible, incredible young man. I've known him since college. Uh, uh, incredible. When he left a really good high paying job in social responsibility in Calvert, where they just loved him, he left to start Honest Tea, like we need another bottled tea product, right? He left to start that with his professor, which is very unusual, his professor from Yale was his uh, partner. And he left when he had just had his third child. His wife was working in a nonprofit as a nonprofit lawyer, but really wasn't working. And his third child had some issues. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, almost died. 
That's when he started. That's when he made the leap. And I remember talking to him saying, don't you think you should wait a year or two? He's going, no, why? So I think that's really important. It's like listening to my kids about having babies. Well, we don't have enough money. Yeah. There's always excuses. Don't let your career be an excuse. Understand your career is a way of you manifesting your love and your concern for not only yourself, but for others. And it's a way of bringing that out there. Business doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be boring. It can be a lot of fun. It can do a lot of good. I've seen a lot of people do great, 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 great things. There's things you put in place to try to make sure that continues, but that's more of the, uh, the, the details. But in terms of the overall, I think it's just incredibly important to recognize that I know for most of us, We've been willing to, I've probably made 20% of what I could have made if I just, now again, I'm not complaining, I've done extremely well. Um, but I'm just saying that I think all of us, it's just what you focus on, where you put your life energy. And I, I prefer putting my life energy into others. I think it really leads to a lot of happiness when you don't think too much about yourself. <laughs> and, I, and I can really say this for all of you who are not almost 70 years old, because the body starts falling apart, and it's really good to think about something besides how many aches and pains you get in your body. <laughs> well, um, thank you, sir, for answering all our questions. I know it's uh, 602 here, so uh, I think with that, unfortunately, we will not be able to get any other questions um, through here. Um, again, I want to uh, very much uh, show our appreciation for Dr. Mark Albion here spending his time with us today and giving us uh, his wisdom on some of these issues and thoughts on them. Uh, again, I mean, I spent 10 or $15 on this book. I definitely recommend everyone to read this. Um, it gave me a lot of cool insight into myself and how I should plan my career forward. So again, doc, thank you, Dr. Albion, for spending your time with us today. Um, and thank you for everyone to coming out and, uh, you know, listening to us. Great. Thank you very much for having me. It's really an honor and, and blessings to all of you. Just realize that each one of us, you know, can really make a difference in our lives and really live a fulfilling life, whatever our circumstances. And I hope that, you know, you're living in a, in a really, uh, I've been around a long time and in the sixties were challenging. I got my hand broken by the police, but I, I wasn't, I was a mixture of a conservative and a progressive at the same time. But um, this is really um, very unusual times, even historically and hopefully we'll use it to come out at a place where we're all one. We recognize that we are all one and we're one with each other and with the planet. So blessings to all of you. Godspeed. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.